everyone. Today I have with me screenwriter and producer Jane Fitzpatrick. Jane recently wrote the screenplay for a movie called The Windcatcher, which is about the life of Sacagawea. Hi, Jane. How are you today? Hi there, Michelle. How are you? Great. So happy, to, had, be, so happy yeah. to be here today. Oh, I'm so happy to have you on. And, you know, when I first um, started doing the research for this, I thought I knew. I was like, oh, I know everything about her. <laughs> You know, I studied that yes. in school, and then the more I got into it, the more I was like, "Oh my gosh, I did not know." And I'm, I'm so grateful that you're going to be coming out with this movie, so that everybody, I think everybody would say, "Oh, I know who that is." Yeah, I really yeah. understand anything about her, you know? Well, it's true. I mean, she's someone that we hear about it in the history class. You know, maybe one line or two. But we really don't know her life. And my goal for Winchester, the story of Sacagawea, is to really see the the Lewis and Clark expedition through her eyes as a Native American woman, 16-year-old, carrying a baby on her back. What did she feel? What did she see? Mm. And what was her purpose? And why do we still remember her over 200 years later? Yes, and I don't feel they told us. And I listened to um, just a you know a quick book on it, and then I watched a couple of YouTube videos and read some articles. and And mm-hmm. what struck me the most is that I don't remember learning that she was 16. You know, it's like I knew mm-hmm. she was young, but I felt like because I knew about the baby, like I always pictured her as older. And you know, I have mm-hmm. daughters. <laughs> picture yes, you know, I know. You know, like that's crazy. yeah. It is. I know. It it truly is. And once you realize what she went through, and uh, in her life, there there are things that people don't know about her early life, um, and and this movie brings that out. It's it's like a chunk of her life. From with, within the two years on the expedition, but then in the very beginning, it's her life before she when she was younger at 12 years old. So uh, it's interesting when we finally put it together. Yes, and I do want to, you know, start from the beginning and, and let everybody know, like, what, how your heart, because I can see the passion in your website about this story, and I wanted to hear, you know, your voice on on how this all came to be and and I love I know you know from reading the article like how you feel connected but I'd love for you to tell everybody else like your you know how connected you feel to her and why you had to do this. Yeah, well, you know, um, it's something that I never really expected in my life for for me to to do. Um, it's not, you know, you don't put all the pieces together until all of a sudden one day you you realize, whoa, something's going on here that's outside of me. That could it really be? And you go back and think about, you know, the things that have happened. Um, I'll just tell you a few things. Uh, it, it is a long journey, a long story, but. Um, and some of them might sound a little bit like, oh, yeah, okay, all right, you know, in the beginning. But when I bring it together for you, I think you will see that uh, there's some spiritual aspects at work here um, along this path. And it, it causes one to open their eyes to something else, and maybe in their own life, what do they what do they become aware of that that they're drawn to or called to do so that's why I like to share this part of it, even though some people might think it I mean it's crazy <laughs> it is it is a, 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 in some ways, but um, I think it's beautiful. Guess, <laughs> the first thing that ever came on this uh, this journey was the day I was born, and I didn't realize until later uh, uh, this this um, connection. But um, I was born in Richland, Washington, 
which is right along the Columbia River where the Lewis and Clark expedition came through. Now, I wouldn't have even thought anything about that, okay? Even the fact that my mom and dad named me Janie, which is the name that Mm -hmm. William Clark gave to Sacagawea because he couldn't pronounce her name. Now, I still wouldn't have thought anything. (laughs) Uh, We had really great dear friends, which we still have, the Brattons, and they are descendants of William Bratton, who was on the Lewis and Clark expedition. So still, you know, it's it's just part of maybe growing up in the Pacific Northwest, whatever. You could chalk it up to that. But as life went on, I had so many people cross my path that were either related to someone on the expedition or they had a connection somehow to that history. Um, in the 60s, I lived, well, I went to high school, late 60s, in uh, Portland, Oregon. I went to Franklin High School. And my, I, there were four friends, myself, Jane, Janie, um, my girlfriend, her name was Janie, <laughs> and we had two, two, boy, two young men that were our friends, Cliff Lewis and John Clark. <laughs> now, I, and and I didn't pick them because of their name. You know, I didn't even put this together in my life. But, you know, as I look back on it, I, I thought, well, that not that interesting? So life went on. Um, I We moved, uh, my mom and dad moved to Indiana, and then I moved back out and on, uh, you know, things happened. Eventually, I got married. And um, my husband and our three children were traveling back from Indiana to Washington State. He had finished his college teaching degree, and we were headed back to the the Northwest. And um, an uncle of mine said, told me, you need to travel the road, the back roads in Montana, past Custer's Left Stand, and toward Bozeman. And we had a you know a, a moving truck, and we also had our car, an old 1970s Chevelle station wagon, and we're all packed into this car and the truck, and we're moving along toward Bozeman. And because of the back roads were so rough, our car had some problems when we got to Bozeman, and we broke down. So we're we're getting the car fixed, and we're sitting there in a restaurant, looking out at this beautiful big sky and mountains and everything. And we look at each other and we think, why don't we just stay here? Something really was tugging at us to stay there. And we just threw caution to the wind, and we didn't have jobs we were going to. And so we said, hey, well, let's just stay. And within a few days, we had a place to stay and Within a week or so, we both had jobs. He had a teaching job, and you know, it just it just fell into place for us. Well, uh-huh. we that was in about 1987, um, and so he was teaching in 87, 88. By 1989, he was going to take a class of kids out to Three Forks, which is the headwaters of the Missouri River. Um, the Gallatin, Madison, and Jefferson Rivers all come together there. And something inside my heart was just like, I really I really want to go. I need to go with you. And we took our kids with his classroom out to this place. And I didn't really understand what was tugging at me or why I felt so... Uh, so emotional there, Mm -hmm. but I truly did, and all week, when we got back, all week, I just said, I I have to go back, so I said to my husband, I have to go back this weekend, it was May 20th, 1989, I'll never forget it, and he said, oh, yeah, he was always supportive of my dreams and everything, even though I never went anywhere without him and the kids, but this was different, and he said, go. 
So I went out there and I, I took my pad of paper and I'm sitting up on Fort Rock, which is overlooking those rivers. And the eagles are flying above me and I'm sitting on a rock and I'm and I'm thinking, you know, this was where that Shoshone girl, Sacagawea, was taken from her people when she was 12 years old, right on that spot. And just then, in my ear, literally, I heard, I want you to tell my story. I can't say that it was like a human would say to you. Mm -hmm. It was just like, I need to tell this story. So I how did you there. know? I don't. I don't want to interrupt you. I just. How did you know that that was the place? Did you had you looked into it, or is there something there? Well, my husband and I had we talked about it because he was going to take his classroom out there, and it was mostly about Lewis and Clark passing through there, oh, okay. and and okay. everything. But I also knew that when she was twelve, she had been taken, and that was the place. Wow. So That's crazy. Um, so I came back to home, and I we didn't have the internet then, so I went over to the university library, Montana State University, and I looked at some books and things, and I thought, well, you know, I'm going to write this as a children's book. Mm. And so I start I started writing it at and. Um, about three chapters into it, it was really interesting because I was reading it to my kids, my daughter, Jara. She was about seven years old at the time, and she was completely fascinated by the story. But I started getting into some things in her in her story that I realized were not for children. They would have been too harsh. And so then I had to make the decision, do I want to water it down for children or do mm-hmm. I want to tell this story the way that it needs to be told? So um, at that point, I just I put it in a, uh, a box and I put it away because I realized that I was not ready to tell this story. And so we ended up moving to Washington and... Between about 1996 and 2003, I literally had my own spiritual awakening in my life, in myself. I realized that I, there was so much more to truth than what I believed in at the time, you know, what I was told at the time. And so, um, so I put I put all my beliefs on the sh- on a shelf that I could see in my mind's eye, you know. Mm-hmm. And I thought, I just want to know the truth. And I began to look into uh, in, into spirituality and oneness and unity and love. And things began to change and open up in myself. And in 2003, my daughter, Jara, the the seven-year-old from in in 89, she said to me, Mom, she was going off to film school down in L.A. She said, you need to get that story out and write it into a screenplay. (sighs) And I thought, I don't know how to write a screenplay, but I'm going to do that. And I went out and I found all my materials and I brought it in and she was going to help me because she was going to film school. So she was going to be able to help me, you know, what she was learning and everything. So I began to write this story. And I, we, at the time, we were uh, remodeling our, our dining room, and we had one wall that was just sheetrock, not, not painted yet. So I drew a, an arc across that wall, and I wrote on 12 pieces of, of card stock paper, the 12 lines they said about Sacagawea in the Lewis and Clark Journal. And I put the, those on this timeline of events. And then I picked one of those and I just backed up uh, what she might have done, what they might have said to, to get them to write that about her. 
and I just began to start putting this story together with what I knew from the journal. And so then I thought, there's so much history about the men, about the expedition, about the journey, and I have to find her. And I, it was it was frustrating a little bit because I there just wasn't a lot about her personally, you know. Mm-hmm. So one day I went I went to Barnes and Noble bookstore and you know I was just going to buy a copy of the Lewis and Clark journals and then some other resource material and I was standing there in the section where they have picture frames and knickknacks and gifts. And there was a paperweight. And I picked it up, and I don't know why I picked it up. It was almost like it was shining for me to pick it up. And I I picked it up, and I looked at it. It was a donut shape, but it's square. And around the edge, it said a, a quote from Michelangelo. And it said, I saw the angel in the granite and carved until I set him free. Mm, And I literally, I literally lost it there in the store. I realized that I think I'm fit to set this story free. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know, but it's, it's not leaving me alone. And that's when I began to put my life together in sequence of how it has pointed me to this place. And so I got home and and I started to just look at it in a different way. And I put my head down on the table, on my desk, and I just started to cry because I thought, who am I to tell this story? How do I know what she would say or do or how how do I know what you feel? And I, with tears on, down, running down my face, I, I just, I looked out into this field that was right across from our house, and this eagle flew across the field, and he landed in this evergreen, and I watched him, and again, I heard the, the, the voice, get out of the way. You have mm-hmm. to get out of the way. And I thought, how do I get out of the way? But I started to write it in a different way. I started to write it from her eyes, not from my eyes, not from a Western woman's eyes. And from there, I looked up on the Internet. I, I got connected to her people, to uh Leo Airwhite, who's the liaison at the uh, Agadika Shoshone tribe there in Idaho. And I connected with him early on through email, and then later I was able to go and visit with him. And I promised them that I was going to do this the right way, protect her story, to make sure that Native American people play Native American parts. They're not going to uh, be sold out to stereotypes or anything like that. That is going to be authentic. And when I promised that I to them, I didn't realize the commitment that it was truly going to require. Because I have been I have been working to protect this story for ten years now. I, I finished it, it took me four years to write it. I started it in Oak Creek and finished it in two thousand seven. And uh from there I I for ten years now I've tried to get it into the right hands and make sure that we have an, an incredible team that sees the vision and wants to protect the story and you know it's been hard I've been through a, a lot of ups and downs I've had people who have tried to take it from me I've had people who uh, I thought were sincere and it ended up not being that way and it was hard for me because I'm 
kind of a, a peace loving person, but mm-hmm. I had to get a harder shell. And I took a two year, I will call it basically a sabbatical. I went down to LA to get an education in Hollywood. My husband, bless his heart, he stayed up here in Washington. He worked so that I could do that. And I just uh, tried to work with people. But the main thing that happened there was I totally had to pour myself out and become that that person that I'm working, still working on. But I got rid of a lot of the things that were in my way, the, the things that were binding me, walls and barriers, for me to truly accept and and realize that the thing that matters the most in our spirituality is belief. If we believe that we are one with the universe and with everything, with all things, and we believe that God, creator, is in us, spirit is in us, and that we have unlimited imagination and we can walk this journey, not afraid. When we believe that, that's all we got to do. We're given the faith to just keep walking into a, a transparency uh, uh, that that brings to us the, the things, the, the desires, our dreams, you know, our heart's desires. So that is really what I learned there. And when I came back home, I I was a little uh, discouraged about you know Hollywood uh, and I'm, just how it in the past has been uh, has operated. And I realized that I there the doors are open in this world now for many independent films and people to uh, be involved in these beautiful stories of history. That and we can um, create them through our visions, through our dreams, and and I would encourage anybody: don't be afraid, because the opportunities are there now for us to um, to make it happen. And so when I came back home, I began to put together a team of people. Um, I met Gerald Oge, who's a, a, an actor in Canada, Canadian actor, and a, a wonderful person, uh, Rick Clark, who is just a, he's a promoter, he's a producer, he has opened doors, financial doors, and people for this. Our, our um, uh, director, Karen Ochoa, she is, has been working in film, has done many, many films, and works with Robert Redford, and she has a vision. Uh, Chris Rainey, who is also a producer out of New Mexico. Um, I don't want to forget anybody. Uh, <laughs> uh, Susan Fonk, she's, she's a, a flathead Indian, um, um, and she is a producer, film producer out of Portland, Oregon. And um, uh, Blaine Ginther, who is uh, one of our promoters for financial promoters out of Kansas. So we have a a wonderful group uh, that is with us. We have all these uh, advisors uh, from on both uh, the, with the Native American side and the Lewis and Clark side. I was able to get wonderful endorsement letters from both. Of, of those uh, groups, and which is invaluable to us. It's just like gold to us. Because what they say is that this story, the Lewis and Clark people say this story aligns so closely with the history, the Lewis and Clark history, that they will get behind it. And her people say this is the true story of our grandmother, Jacqueline. So to have that, and, you know, it's, there is a spiritual connection from a realm 
that I believe that she is a part of, that she is has is in and is is leading, directing, guiding us just because I know how the, all of these things in my life has trans, have transpired to get to this place, to make this happen, that this truly has been an entire lifetime of walking, even before I even knew it. Mm. And to me, I'm just grateful. I am so thankful and so grateful to know what my calling is. And even I've told people, if it takes my last breath, this is what I'll do. Even though it's sac- I've sacrificed a lot for it, it doesn't matter. Because, I mean, what else is going to do, you know? this She has come through the ages to tell her story. Now, I will tell you that this story message is about oneness, unity, love, bringing people together, which is a story that our world needs. And the timing will be perfect for it. Mm. And also the awareness that, you know, we've heard of these Native girls who have been stolen, killed, you know, kidnapped. She was one of them. She was kidnapped. She was stolen. She was forced into slavery. She was uh, bargained off for a gun to a French trapper. She became pregnant. And she was still a young girl. And yet, there are more statues of her than any other woman in American history. And she still is remembered today. Why? It's because she has a message that's relevant to our world. She's an icon. And uh, we do plan on uh, filming the theater version of the production, but also a version of it that can be shown in schools. Because with this much um, backing uh, from, from history and from her people, we feel that everyone can benefit from knowing this woman and falling in love with her, really, because right. she is she is a powerful spirit. And, and, and it's an exciting was, project. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and what I was thinking is that I feel like you were picked because why hasn't it happened yet? If she is, you know, she does have all these statues and she, you know, I was thinking you had to be the person because otherwise it would have been told. The story would be out there already, you know, yes. because of how many years it was. So that to me also points to, you know, why you were chosen to do this play, you know, to do this movie and, and play and whatever it becomes, you know, book and, and everything yes. because how little, they wrote 12 lines about her. Well, yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. And and uh, I think one of the reasons too that, it, and you're right about that. I think one of the reasons too that her story hasn't been told is because it's not an obvious story. It's not one like um, like other Native Americans or. Uh, other periods of time, like the Civil War, they're all stories written down about a person. She, own, the, what what we have about her are those twelve lines, but also what we have is the tradition and culture of her people, of a woman of her time period. But when it comes to um, Seeing or grasping what she would feel and express to us, 
it takes that spiritual place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It takes it. And so I'm just, you know, it, yeah, I think some and people could write this, write a story about her, but this doesn't come from me. You see what I mean? It, it comes mm-hmm. from somewhere else, uh, you know, and that's why I'm so grateful because I felt like I, it was a, like it was coming to us, to all of us in in this way. And so it was a very beautiful thing. I, When I was trying to find the kind of person, uh, her personality, her character, there was one uh, a part of the journal that really stuck out to me as I was reading. And it was after they got to Fort Clatsop in Oregon, and they had been there for the winter. They were about ready to go back back east um, and leave. She had not actually seen the ocean yet. Mm-hmm. I was just going to I was going to have you tell the story. That's exactly I was waiting yes, to have you tell she, the story. So just, please, <laughs> please tell everybody okay. this is an amazing story. Yeah. Well, she, you know, when they first got to the ocean, they were at Cape Disappointment, but it was completely shrouded in fog. And so they didn't couldn't see the water. So they went back up river and across over to Uh, the Oregon side, and she actually was involved in helping them vote for where to winter, which was awesome. So they're at Fort Classic in Oregon, and um, an Indian comes in, a Native American comes into the fort and tells them all that there's a a whale washed up on the beach. And she's hearing this. Okay, and that she knows they're preparing to go to leave to go back east. Mm-hmm. So she gets up her courage, and she follows Captain Clark down the path to the canoes to the to the canoe launch, and she is saying to him that she needs to talk to him, and of course her husband is telling her, be quiet, be quiet, you know, woman. But Mm -hmm. she doesn't let him bother her. And she goes to the point with Clark, she said, for me to come this far and not see the great water would be too hard. And now with the big fish, Mm -hmm. I have to see it. Now, mind you, she's 16. Mm -hmm. She's a Native American woman back in 1806. Yet she's standing up for herself. Mm -hmm. She's not afraid. She's saying, I want to go to the ocean. And Clark turns to her and says, I never thought. Of course you'll want Mm -hmm. to see. Mm -hmm. And he took her. So that little episode from the journal created for me this character, this in-depth character of this woman that really started out when she was 12, when she was taken by a warring tribe, you know, hiked from Three Forks, Montana to Bismarck, North Dakota, by foot, sold into slavery, traded for a gun, you know, and her life probably seemed just like, what else can I do? Mm -hmm. But Providence came along and opened a door for her to go on this expedition to make her way home to her people because she knew they had horses that these explorers needed mm-hmm. to get over the mountain. And so she found a way to be included in the expedition. And that's why we remember her today because she had a door that she walked through mm-hmm. and she just kept walking, literally kept walking. And it didn't stop because now here we are today with this woman 
at his story. And I believe, I truly believe the world is going to want to hear. Oh, because yeah. it, is not, it is not just a, a United States story. It is a story that touches the world because of the message of oneness, of bringing people together, of love, compassion. And it truly is going to change the world. I yeah. truly believe that. I, I do too. And the thing that I learned that I didn't know also, well, I never had heard that story, and that was just amazing to me. But the other story that I didn't hear is that at one point, doesn't she, when she meets her people, doesn't she find a brother? And, and she's actually given the chance to not continue on, and she chooses to go with Lewis and Clark? Is that true? Well, it's partly true, and there's so much uh, conflict in the story. Uh, there's so much um, uh, controversy in the in okay. entire story of Sacagawea. But it's, uh, it is... It is very true. In the journal, the Lewis and Clark journal, um, and the historians will stand by this, um, too, is that when they got to her people, um, she, she recognized um, a family member uh, who happened to be the chief of the tribe, Tammy Wade. Now, she didn't know this. If you can imagine her sitting in the big ceremonial teepee, and she's just the only woman in there, but she has to translate from Shoshone to Hadassah, (laughs) to her husband, to Hadassah. Mm -hmm. Her husband, who knows Hadassah, has Mm -hmm. to translate from Hadassah to French, and the French interpreter there, Labiche, he has to translate from French (laughs) to English. And this is, they're, they're sitting there. Well, in my, as I wrote this, I could literally see her standing up because she's looking at the chief who's sitting there with his big headdress on, and she recognizes him as, what the journals say, her brother. And she runs over to him. This is literally from the journals, and the men were in tears. Because she mm-hmm. runs over to him, and at first he's taken aback. You know, who is this woman that, you know? Mm-hmm. But then he looks at her face in the firelight, and he says, Omer, which is the name that she had before she was taken. And mm-hmm. it is a beautiful homecoming. And of course, the Lewis and Clark. Soldiers, they're they're going. How could we be so lucky? You know that we need these horses, and here this is her 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 relative people, right? Who is here? Okay, so that really uh, secured their horses for them. Now I was uh, visiting her people in Idaho, and I felt truly honored to be given this information. And what they told me was that the journal recorded Tammy Way as her brother because everyone in the tribe were brother and sister. That's just how they spoke of Oh, I see. Other. Okay. He said, but actually in their family line, family tree, Tammy Waite was her uncle. And he said, to be an uncle is a whole different relationship than to be a brother. Because the aunts and uncles disciplined the nieces and nephews in their culture. And so he said, and and when he said that, I could, I just saw in my, in my mind the whole thing changing as far as the uncles, um, effect on her mm-hmm. being her an uncle as opposed to being her brother and he said please set history straight please set it right he said we 
we have known this, but you know, we we are not we we are not going to be able to change that. But maybe this could. And so, um, I have been you know I've had uh, some historians say, oh, don't do that because it'll discredit what you're doing. But I want to be very clear. I'm I'm not doing this story to uh, to to uh, squelch the controversy. Mm-hmm. I am doing this story through her eyes. Right. And when it's through her eyes, mm-hmm. I feel that uh, it opens up a dialogue. It opens up oh talking goodness. about this and bringing this out to the forefront that people people are important and and relationships are important the family is important i i just see it as being a uh, a healing uh, mm-hmm. part and i'm glad you brought that up because because of that and and another um thing that is a controversy is her name mm-hmm. and uh, to some people, to her people, it's Sacagawea. Mm-hmm. To the uh, Hadatsa people, it's Sakagawea. To other folks, are, it's Sakakawea. Mm-hmm. And so um, I felt, again, through her eyes, I wrote the story um, from her people's point of view. Okay, so I used Sacagawea. Mm-hmm. But here's the controversy that I understand. Um, the Hadatsa people, when they when they took her to their village, gave her the name Sakagawea. Sakagawea, sorry. Sakagawea means bird woman, and it's, it's spelled with a G, S A C A G A W E A. Right. It means Bird woman, okay. Um, the the Shoshone people have a similar word, Sakajawea with a J, S A C A J A W E A, which in their language means boat pusher. Over time, it has really been accepted by people because nobody really knows this history. That because it's a little bit easier to say Sacagawea, but it has adapt, adopted the meaning of bird woman. So mm-hmm. now you have a Sacagawea, which really means boat pusher, but now you have it accepted as meaning bird woman. So it is a controversy that that goes on, but again, I'm not here to uh, to answer. The controversy, what I want to do is celebrate her life. Mm -hmm. Sacagawea, 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 it was this young woman who had significant, uh, just contributions, gave significant contributions to not only the expedition by getting horses, by finding her people for them, but also uh, now as she wants us to know something. And uh, so it is there. It, the controversies are absolutely beautiful, and what I'm 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 working on a beautiful way within the film to bring together the G and the J and making it so that we can all get around this and just lift her up as, um, you know, as an important icon in our history. Uh, you know, and, and when people find out that how much she did do for Lewis and Clark, I mean, that's that's the thing. It's like they what they did was amazing, but her part in history – I, I want all little girls to understand, like, she had a huge part in history. And they would say that there were things that she did that, you know, 
that they wouldn't have been able to do. And, and you know, the way she fed them and, and the things she knew they yeah. didn't know. She she was so oh. much, so much, you know, more, uh, I, don't know, I don't know how to say it. Like she, she knew, she knew how to live off the land and they did not know how That's to live right. off the land, you know. That's right. And many times they were hungry. Okay. Right. And they there was no there was no game and she found uh wild potato, you know, the wild potatoes and mm-hmm. um it was because of her, the berry the you know, the wild blueberries and it was because of her that right. they were able to get through that. Um in fact uh, when they were at Cape Disappointment uh, there on the or- on the Washington coast, mm-hmm. they were going to vote to see where they wanted to stay or for the winter. Uh, there were several locations that they could have uh, made for their winter camp, and and Clark asked they asked her to contribute a vote, and she did. <laughs> she and and York, who was the black slave. Mm-hmm. It was an, an amazing, uh, diverse group of people that traveled together in this expedition, and there is another whole uh, part of relevancy to our world mm. today, that they could get, get along, that they could be successful, that they came together. But York was asked to vote, and then, you know, at that time in 1805, right, know, uh, right. Black people were not allowed to vote. Women were not allowed to vote, let alone Native American women. But they asked them both to vote, and they did. And with her, they asked her opinion, which is amazing, in the journal. And Mm -hmm. she said, we need to pick a place where there are wapato, where there are the most wild potatoes. Because that was so important to the journey that mm-hmm. it kept them alive. So yes, I mean her contribution in in so many ways. Just and the baby too, the little boy. I mean, as he grew, can you imagine these men on this expedition? <laughs> and here is the baby, a little boy that was born February 11th, and they left. A couple months later, and and he was not very old, and they watched him grow, even learn to walk. And Clark called him his little dancing boy. And you can imagine, you've seen little babies, you know, just yeah. learning to hold on to things and dancing because of the music. And they had music. They had the fiddle. Right. You know, the the twang, and they had, you know, they would sing, and uh, York had uh, was would sing. He had a, a deep voice, and they, it was, it was a fascinating um, community that they had, and this little baby was part of it, and he he, he earned uh, his uh, little dancing boy name. From Clark, uh, because you know he was just like any little kid that we have today, and it it brought a humanity to you know this expedition. And the the another thing that reminds me of another thing that was so so beautiful. She wore vermilion paint across her forehead, down her cheeks, and in the part of her hair. She wore it every day. And they didn't know what it meant, but Clark asked her what it meant. And this was well into the the trip. Mm-hmm. And he finally he asked her. She had been sick, and he she was in the movie. She was... Um, uh, bathing, you know, getting, cleaning her hair and everything, getting cleaned up after being sick. And um, he came to her and asked her what it meant. And she said to him, the spirit is with us. It says we come in peace. 
Now, if she had not, and all the Native Americans that they came mm. encountered would know that that on her face that she chose to wear, mm-hmm. then she comes in peace. It is, wow. it is just, uh, you know, a a beautiful, thoughtful, uh, incredible decision decision she made to uh, to wear that as they went on this journey. So I, I just that was another thing, another contribution yeah. that she well, gave. Right, and, and they didn't even know. And and can you imagine? You know, if she hadn't done, like, they didn't even realize how much she was saving them because of that. That's right. You know, that she That's knew, right. you know? Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, That's Jane, right. I am just, when, do you have any idea when we're going to get to see this? I mean, are there, is there a definite <laughs> date? <laughs> well, I, um, I wish there was. <laughs> I know. Um, at, at this time, we are, um, of course, we're looking for funding, funding sources. Um, it's a big movie. Um, we've got uh, quite a few people interested. Um, we're looking at some development funds coming in fairly soon. Uh, we're, we're going to be starting development soon. Well, we hope to be in pre-production by late spring, maybe mm-hmm. early summer. Um, we would love to be able to start filming this in this year. I mean, that's really, we have to put that out there as our goal. Yes. Because I believe it's timely. I believe it's um, just important to our world to have this story soon, uh, as soon as possible. And um, I know that, I, I, like I told you, belief is the thing that I learned. And that is what's driving me through this entire journey to believe. Mm-hmm. And I still, I'm not stopped it. I know it's coming. When something takes this much effort to come to you, you yeah. know, even yeah. going through uh, time periods, you know, eras, ages, to come to us now. In this time, you know that it's not going to stop, that it's going to come to fruition. And, well, you know, I, I believe so. <laughs> I believe it yeah. definitely will. And and I love the name Windcatcher. And <clears throat> if there's anything, I mean, I'll put it on my social media. You forward me oh. any updates or anything that you I have. I will. And I yes. will put it out there so that you get all the support that you need. And, I mean, I'm just one person, but, you know, so who knows, you know. You never oh, know who's going to see it, you know. Yeah, that's right. And we do have Windcatcher, the story, Windcatcher colon, the story of Sacagawea group on Facebook. And then we have windcatcherthemovie.com, our website, our official website. And um, those are the two places that um, updates, we give updates there, um, people that are added to the team, any kind of trips that we might be taking or uh, we should be putting on there a casting call uh, at some time over the next few months, um, mm-hmm. which could be fun for people. Uh, oh, Absolutely. So, Absolutely. That's why, and I will put those links on this um, on this YouTube uh, video. I will put all the links. And like I said, if you you know if you blast it out on, I, I see you on LinkedIn and you know different things like that, and on Facebook. And I will definitely share it. And you know we'll get as many people. You know I want I want lots of people to see this because I think it's important, yeah. just like you do. And I am so grateful that I found you because. I would have never <laughs> known this story, and I loved it. It was so much fun, you know, doing the research oh, for it. So I'm so happy that I yeah. found you. Oh, I'm. thank you so very much. I appreciate your spirit around it, too. You just, uh, you. I can sense your excitement for her and her story, and that just makes me very happy And because I know that, you know, people are going to be open and receptive 
when yeah. they when they hear. The history is fascinating in itself. Exactly. But, uh, you know. No, so. but her story needs to be told, and I, I'm very grateful that yes. you're telling it. So oh, I, I think it's you. perfect, and um, and we will keep in touch. And I can't wait. I can't wait to see. Oh, it. thank you so much. I okay. appreciate it. Okay. Well, All right. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.